Hi, I'm going to walk us through a handful of community science projects that Sageland Collaborative has been involved with within the Jordan River water. Um, next, I'll follow that with some lessons learned over our organization's 25 years um, doing this, types of, this type of work and some future directions that pertain to the Jordan River watershed. So Sageland Collaborative is a nonprofit located in Salt Lake City. As of 2021, we've been around for 25 years, and you may actually know us better as Wild Utah Project. We changed our name to better represent our, um, what we do in September of this year. And um, our mission hasn't changed at all. Um, we still provide science and science-based strategies for wildlife and land conservation. A key part of our work is that we rely really heavily on volunteers, especially community scientists, to carry out habitat conservation projects and data collection. Um, all of our community science projects are targeted at a specific conservation or management need. So I'm going to walk through some examples today um, and kind of describe how these different projects are structured. Here is our team at Sage and Collaborative. We have our, our uh, boss, uh, Josh Wood, at the helm as executive director. And Sarah Woodbury here is our um, communications director. And then we have three scientists who are uh, trained in conservation. So Mary Pendergast, Janice Gardner, and myself here, Rose Smith. Um, even though we're a small group, we get a lot done through uh, collaboration and partnerships, hence the collaborative in our new name. We work closely with um, not only volunteers, but also landowners, academic institutions, government agencies, and other nonprofits, community groups. So this is just a subset of the local, federal, and state organizations that we partner with. I'll, um, I'll be going over a few different projects and different combinations of these partners are involved in each of the projects. So when we think about community science, we don't just think about volunteers kind of from the public, but also the entire community of science and practitioners who are involved in conservation in our community. Each of our projects is linked not only to um, just broadly um, wildlife and wildlands conservation, but also these kind of specific broader sub goals, such as promoting habitat connectivity. So how connected is the landscape for different wildlife, um, protecting specific species of conser high conservation need and restoring critical habitats. So habitats that are disproportionately degraded. Um, so these are the handful of projects I'm going to go over. Um, we're currently working on each of these projects within the Jordan River watershed. It's not an exhaustive list of our current projects, um, but each has a different aspect or highlights a different aspect of community science that um, is kind of interesting to contrast um, among them. I'll start here with the Rosie Finch Conservation Project at the top of the watershed. Uh, the Rosie Finches are um, can be seen at Alta Ski Area, for instance, and so I think of them as kind of at the very top of our Jordan River drainage. Um, the rosy finches are found in these high alpine environments, and um, so they're threatened for a bunch of different reasons um, related to their habitat. Um, next is Wasatch Wildlife Watch. So this is also um, focused in the Wasatch Front, um, the mountains of the Wasatch Front, as well as, as, well as the Jordan River. Um, so I'll kind of discuss how that project is structured. Um, and then we'll talk about the plants and pollinators and amphibian assessments as well. That includes the boreal toad assessment. And both of those projects are statewide, but they are, um, we do a lot of that work in the Jordan River watershed as well. And then I'll end on the riparian and stream um, restoration project, which is actually um, unique because we're not solely collecting data on that project, but we're also doing the um, hands-on restoration. And um, yeah, so like I said, each of these projects kind of requires a different set of, um, or each of these projects is structured a little bit differently, requires different skills or levels of training. And so there's kind of a nice portfolio of ways for folks to get involved. <laughs> Also, I'll start with the Rosie Finch project, and this is led by our uh, conservation ecologist, Janice Gardner. Um, I'll go over this project um, just really briefly. Rosie finches are gorgeous black and pink colored birds. Um, they breed in high alpine environments, and the black rosy finch is a, it's considered a species of the highest conservation concern due in large part to the lack of data um, understanding their 
their movement and their range. We do know that they inhabit high alpine environments, however, and so because of that, they um, there's concern about climate change. So the community science aspect of this project addresses the data gaps regarding that and um, helps the scientists and conservationists on our team um, evaluate potential solutions. So there are kind of three prongs to this project. There are RFID enabled bird feeders. Um, so we get the actual kind of like movement of the birds through that. Um, and then um, another partner at an academic institution analyzes stable isotopes of bird feathers to look at the um, seasonal kind of use of water and um, as the birds are migrating. And then feeder counts are where the community scientists come in and help collect this data. So volunteers take part in a one hour online training and commit to regular monitoring of their feeder locations throughout the winter. Data collected by these volunteers is also used to inform the next steps um, for a science and practitioners working group that Janice Gardner is leading this winter after compiling, se several, compiling several years of data. Um, next, I'm going to just briefly describe Wasatch Wildlife Watch. So this project is motivated by the um, need to understand wildlife ecology at that wildlife, wildland urban interface. We define that as kind of the zone where human habitations are encroaching on lands where maybe wildlife were used, accustomed to not being um, or having the lands to themselves. So there's a great need for data on kind of how the wildlife or how different um, wildlife um, species are moving around, large mammals, for instance, big cats, how they move around, how they use the trails that humans also use um, and, and how we can best manage for them. This um, project is also, um, um, they're also partners with yeah, UDOT. So we work on kind of like road mitigation stuff as well. Um, and it's been a wildly successful project so far. It began in 2018, and since then, our volunteers have, and staff have, have established 1,400 camera sites. So these are camera traps that take a photo when there's movement. Um, and that includes 250 new cameras that were established in 2021. Um, over 10,000 volunteer hours were, have contributed to date, um, including 3,000 volunteer hours in 2021. Um, as you can see from this map, so if you kind of squint, you can see Salt Lake City in the background, and then these individual dots are all the camera traps. Um, we cover the Wasatch Front pretty well, as well as the um, Jordan River Parkway with these camera traps. So we have a really great um, data set kind of looking at the presence of um, wildlife throughout this urban wildland interface. This project has a, um, a high commitment level for volunteers. They have to attend an online training and they have to commit to several visits to their assigned camera throughout the summer. There are separate um, volunteer opportunities to go through the images over the winter. Some volunteers like to do both with their own camera data. Others like prefer one or the other. So it's an accessible activity for those who aren't able to hike. This work is so far resulted in six peer-reviewed papers describing the spatial and temporal um, patterns in wildlife dispersal. This type of data set can be used to inform best management practices such as signage or wildlife bridges, um, but this method is also just super useful for other regions that have similar kind of urban wildland interface issues um, and uh, uh, showing a way that they can uh, collect data and understand these issues where they live. Another one of our important projects is the amphibian habitat assessment, and this includes our work with the boreal toad. Um, this work is largely, um, we, we partner closely with Hogle Zoo on this project. Um, boreal toad was once a common amphibian in these mountains, um, but it's pending endangered st status currently. Uh, threats to the toad include habitat degradation of riparian areas. Um, they thrive kind of in the wet meadows and riparian zones of the, you saw, uh, the Rocky Mountains. Um, also, they're threatened by pesticides, disease, including chytrid fungus. Um, so cataloging this habitat and also the toad presence in their habitat is crucial for um, just understanding their, their current extent and disentangling different impacts that might help to um, better conserve the toad. 
this project uh, for volunteers involves a range of different commitment levels. So volunteers all need to participate in a two hour training and this has been held online since 2020. Um, and then they carry out independent site visits to pre-established locations. Um, so there's um, hiking involved and the um, some data collection on the water quality um, and the, just the habitat quality overall. There's also some um, swabbing for the chytrid fungus if folks are up for that as well. Um, and so we made these maps of like potentially high quality and fair um, toad habitat and these are used to um, prioritize where the monitoring sites go or where the volunteers go to do the monitoring. This year, um, we had a great year. Staff and volunteers carried out 150 site visits and documented 25 active breeding habitats. So, um, and this project has also led to the ad adoption of standard field protocols that are now used statewide. Um, so that's always like another outcome of these projects that we really strive for is making sure that our data collection um, protocols are um, usable for others. Our, uh, another statewide project that is also um, like focused a lot in the Jordan River watershed is our plants and pollinators project. So this one's all, this one and the boreal toad are both led by Mary Pendergast. And um, yeah, similarly statewide, um, and it focuses on two species of pollinators that are the highest um, conservation concern in Utah. So the um, monarch, especially the Western monarch population has declined significantly in the last decade and there's a great need for increased data on their um, their range and their population numbers and then secondly is the western bumblebee um, it has declined similarly to the monarch and um, just there's a great need for more data so volunteers on this project participate in a two-hour online seminar. It used to be in person and has been online since 2020. Um, and then they go out with a smart with their smartphone. And um, there's kind of like two ways to engage with this one. You can either just incidentally um, log when you see a pollinator, so a, a bumblebee or a monarch. Um, and then the other kind of track is to take on more of a stewardship role and um, take on one site and commit to visiting that site at least twice during the summer, doing a more kind of scientifically robust survey of presence and absence in that site. Um, and this data is all uh, logged on smartphones and so it goes directly into the database and it's really useful for um, our um, partners at DNR, for instance, for making decisions about um, pollinator habitat and um, restoration efforts. Um, so yeah, these data gaps are really, um, they're really a huge issue for pollinator conservation and even just understanding where the milkweed habitat is, which is crucial for the monarch butterfly, um, is really helpful for, um, future conservation efforts. Um, and we also plant milkweed seeds at our stream sites when we can, at our stream restoration sites. So now I'm gonna go into that stream and riparian restoration program. And I'm gonna give you all a little bit of history on this one. Um, and then I'll kind of talk about the volunteer side last. So um, just a bit of a, as a bit of motivation, 40% or so of streams in Utah are, have been classified as degraded. Um, our stream and riparian program seeks to address this both through monitoring and also on the ground restoration of stream and riparian habitat. This is, actually one of the original projects of Wild Utah Project, though it has evolved over time. Um, so originally this project, this program was set up to monitor stream habitat quality across the Grand Staircase Escalante region um, using our published Rapid Stream and Riparian Assessment Tool, or RSRA. Volunteers, um, back in the day, volunteers were trained to carry out the RSRA through a week-long camping um, trip or event. Um, the RSRA involves a lot of kind of like um, in the field um, 
measurements and a lot of kind of decision making while you're out there. And so it ends up being a pretty complicated method. So over time, this these volunteer trainings have evolved more into training kind of like practitioners who have a bit more background in stream and riparian ecology. Um, and we found that that's a more effective way of getting folks um, actually to do the RSRA without us <laughs> after being trained. So um, we still kind of do the monitoring, but then our project evolved even more recently to um, begin actually restoring streams. And so we use a science-based method um, um, based in the ecology of beavers and the way that beavers uh, affect habitats to um, restore streams. Um, so these are known as beaver dam analogs, basically human built beaver dams. Um, and the structures are part of a process based restoration movement in which low tech interventions support natural processes such as wood and sediment ac accumulation um, and sometimes even um, can encourage beavers to return. So here, this photo here is just of a handful of volunteers after they are very, have very proudly built the beaver dam um, in the Park City area. And these are um, four out of five beavers that we helped our partners at the Division of Wildlife Resources release into a restored site in 2021. Beaver have many beneficial aspect, um, impacts on streams. So you may be wondering why why we're doing all this work around beaver. Um, they, the structures that they build naturally um, help to slow water flows and increase water table elevation. This promotes um, not only sediment storage, but also water kind of moving into the banks and um, helping trees and other vegetation thrive, especially in the West where water table fluctuations. So when the water table goes up and down a lot um, can really affect vegetation. This is so crucial to have this kind of like green strip of habitat throughout um, arid regions. So the way it works for our organization is that we design, permit, and build these structures. Yes, we do use permits. Um, they, we. Uh, are experts in kind of taking care of the permitting side of things as well as kind of the science and the volunteer base. Um, so in 2018, we built our first BDAs with some partners. And since then we've kind of been like broadening the base of folks we partner with and we've installed over 300 um, Beaver Dam analogs since that time. Um, we've worked in right around 20 stream reaches um, and 200 volunteers in 2021 alone contributed 1500 hours to this. It's a very popular volunteer event because it's so fun to act like a beaver. Um, and now after doing this work for three or four years, we're starting to see that beavers are naturally dispersing back into a lot of the sites. And there's one site where we've actually been kind of cleared to help folks uh, at DWR, Division of Wildlife Resources, um, relocate beavers who were trapped elsewhere back into streams and they've established in those streams as well. So um, not only are we helping to restore these physical habitats, but we're also building community. And I think that that's um, probably even more important than the habitat work itself. Um, this volunteer event, this type of volunteer event, um, it's not strictly citizen science or community science in the um, classic sense because there's not actual data being collected. However, there's a lot of learning happening while we're doing these. There's a lot of fun being had. Um, and it's in some ways it can act as a gateway drug to our other more technical community science projects um, because folks get really excited about learning more about what we do. Um, so yeah, I guess it's, the most important part of this project and all of our volunteer work really is that the building community and kind of meeting our neighbors and um, just getting, you know, getting out. <laughs> so, um, the, so a few lessons, these are just kind of, kind of some basic lessons that we've learned over 25 years of community science in the Jordan River watershed um, and across Utah. Sorry, my head in this little, I have this little circle and I'm kind of moving out of the frame. Um, so the community of volunteers never ceases to impress. This is something that I just kind of picked up on when I, as I joined Sage and Collaborative. Um, the, the, the fact that our volunteer events fill up, the number of people who sign up for these trainings is just so impressive. And 
Um, if you've been working in community science, this probably isn't a surprise to you. Um, nextly, um, design of projects targeted at specific data needs um, is a really it's really important to design projects in that way, at least for the, our organization's mission, because we are a science organization. We are not just doing this data collection for the sake of education. Um, it's really um, targeting people's efforts toward a specific goal. And I, it, in my experience, that has been, it makes for a better, um, it, it makes for a better experience for the volunteers too, because they feel more connected to a part of a, a community. Um, and then the third point is that high quality training leads to higher quality data collection. So the, the design and the training of the projects really does um, impact the, how, how well things go. And um, during the 2020, 2021 years, uh, we've shifted a lot of our training online. And so these resources are just available for anyone to take a look at. And um, that has kind of allowed us to have this kind of polished standing um, training um, materials out there that are high quality. And that's really helped us to collect, I think, even more data than we had in previous years. Um, and then the last lesson is kind of, kind of comes from that stream rest or the stream monitoring stuff um, is that it's not every method is suitable for all types of groups. And um, like, for instance, the riparian habitat monitoring is, um, there is a community building aspect to that those like broader trainings that's really valuable, but um, some uh, some so, some methods are just not quite suitable for folks to kind of take and and run with, especially in the the world we're currently living in. So methods that are more based on maybe like asynchronous um, data collection, like our pollinator pursuit and like uh, app based or phone based stuff, um, tend to be really um, um, really valuable. And then if you're not using kind of like an asynchronous method, um, having more of like a group um, event, it can be really effective as well. But something in the middle there where you kind of need a few people, but it's not being led by scientists, that's where it can get into a bit of a gray area and be a little less effective at collecting high quality data, if that's your goal. So having gone through kind of a handful of projects that we um, carried out in um, recent years, I'll just highlight a couple things that I'm looking forward to within the Jordan River watershed, specifically um, along the Jordan River Parkway and then our Great Salt Lake wetlands and waterbirds work. Oops. So we've, um, at Sageland, have become involved with the Big Bend um, of the Jordan River and that the restoration project that's going on, developing a, basically an oxbow channel to slow down high flows and increase riparian habitat. And our role here is to help design the ecological data collection methods um, and help bring in um, community members to be engaged at this site. And our the way that we kind of conceptualize this in this very high tech diagram here is that the data collection itself and the community engagement together will help inform how to best manage the site. Um, and then there, there's kind of a loop that kind of goes back um, that I didn't draw here, but <laughs> this uh, adaptive management kind of goes both ways. So as we manage, we continue monitoring and then um, the data informs whether we need to manage in a different way or um, continue on. So we think of this as kind of like a long-term commitment to this project. Um, and then another program that we that has kind of already started but is spinning up um, increasingly is um, with Janice Gardner at the helm is our Great Salt Lake Wetlands and Waterbirds project. And so we foresee in the future there being some some opportunities for community science here as well. So far, we just uh, we've had um, uh, we published a really great set of. Um, um, science needs basically and management needs based on interviews with um, with folks who are practitioners on the ground in Great Salt Lake. Um, and so we're hoping to um, expand that project in coming years and have some exciting community science opportunities in the near future. So with that, I'll just wrap it up and feel free to contact me and ask questions. I look forward to hearing from you. Thanks.